Hello, my name is Dolly Boyd, Museum Manager at the City of Moses Lake Museum and Art Center. The presentation you're about to enjoy was originally recorded on February 25th, 2021. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this program was presented from the native lands of the Moses, Sinkayus, and Columbia people who has stewarded this land for generations. This presentation was made possible by support from Humanities Washington. Humanities Washington has support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Washington Secretary of State's Office, the Thomas S. Foley Institute, and many other private and public donors. This presentation is called She Traveled Solo, Strong Women in the Early 20th Century. It was presented by Tessa Hulls. She is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and outdoors woman who focuses on women's stories, and her writing has appeared in The Washington Post, Atlas Obscura's Kick-Ass Women series. She is a frequent public lecturer and performer and has appeared at the Seattle Art Museum, Washington Ensemble Theater, Annex Theater, and many other locations. We hope you enjoy this recording of Tessa Hall's She Traveled Solo, Strong Women in the Early 20th Century. So I am very excited to be presenting on one of my favorite topics, and um, that is women who pretty much adamantly refused to do what was expected of them in the times where they lived. And the reason that I chose this particular focus of the early 20th century is it's because when reliable documentation first becomes available, so it's not that suddenly women started doing things that they hadn't been doing all along, but because of the technology surrounding communication, um, we see in the early 1900s that these visual images and these stories become much more widely broadcast. So I actually wanna start us off with a little bit of a timeline of communications technology, which basically begins in 1493 with the invention of the printing press. And for about three centuries, things kind of went along at a, a slow evolution. But then in the 1800s, there was this explosion of new advances. So in 1816, the first fixed image camera was invented. And um, interesting little trivia note, the first telegram ever sent contained the text, what hath God wrought? So they thought that, that this technology was, uh, was inconceivable. So just kind of fun to put. In 1876, the telephone was invented, followed by the moving film camera in 1886. And then finally the radio in 1895, just at the end of the century. So all of the women that I'm gonna talk about tonight were born during this period of revolution. And um, I'm choosing to focus on this era because again, this is when we start to see evidence. And there's one thing that happens in the year 1900. And if we were doing this in person, I would have everyone guess, but Zoom, this is tricky. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you that in the year 1900, Kodak releases the Kodak Brownie. And this camera is marketed on a platform of ease of use and affordability, and they sell it for just $1. And you can see in the original ads up at the top, any school boy or girl. So this was aimed towards all genders from the outset. And in some of the other early ads, you can see women carrying these cameras. So it wasn't something that was supposed to be just for men. And the slogan of the brownie was, take along a brownie. So what this means is that suddenly people who are middle class have access to the ability to take pictures of their lives. And there's this transformation that happens where the camera goes from being an object that you would put in front of your fainting couch to suddenly being something that you could take with you when you went to go summit a mountain. And so previously, when you see images of women on expeditions, they're from a really elite social class because they're the sorts of women who basically have teams of porters who can carry all their things. Um, but once the brownie comes along, it becomes much more equitable and we start to see images from the lives of middle-class women. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm discussing women who were born in a year that starts with 1-8 and died in a year that ends in 1-9. And just to kind of set the scene for, for what women's rights and women's lives were like during this era, at this point, women were not allowed to own their own property. They were not allowed to initiate a divorce. They obviously could not vote yet. And um, 
one of the, the stories I like to talk about is the saying rule of thumb actually has to do with how it was still legal for a husband to beat his wife so long as he used a stick that was narrower than the width of his thumb. So just want to put a little bit of context as to the social climate these women were operating in. The first woman I want to talk about is Mary Kingsley, and you can see her right here sitting in the middle of a dugout canoe in West Africa. And she was born into a position of immediate social stigma because her father was the head of a, a fairly wealthy household and her mother was the nurse. And they were actually only married four days after she was born. So this was absolutely scandalous. And her father chose to dodge his embarrassment over the circumstances of her birth by leaving for years at a time. And he is quoted as saying that he mistrusted intelligent women. So he denied um, Mary access to an education and aside from helping her or teaching her German so that he could help have help in his translation work, um, she really didn't have much of an education. And she wrote in her journals, I cried bitterly at not being taught things. But Mary was a very inquisitive, resourceful woman, and she took advantage of her father's long absence by reading her way through his library. So she was able to gain a really robust, well-rounded well knowledge of the world through those books. And eventually she found herself in a position where both of her parents had died, and for the first time in her life, she wasn't in a role of a caretaker. So she had a small inheritance and decided that she wanted to head out exploring. So she went down to West Africa and she wrote in a letter to a friend that she quote, wanted to go down to West Africa to die. But she did not die. She instead began a series of solo expeditions into what later would become Cameroon. And she was really interesting in that she held beliefs that ran counter to the ideology of British imperialism. And she criticized missionary groups for denying the validity of indigenous belief systems. And one quote from her, she said that um, they treated African people as, quote, an empty jug they could fill with their secondhand rubbishy white culture. So obviously she was not at all afraid to speak her mind, but she was conservative in some other ways. And nowhere was this more apparent than in her wardrobe. So this is not too far off from what she would wear when she was bushwalking through the jungle. She always did this in full skirts and she actually carried a little dagger with her and it wasn't for self-defense. It was so that if she was kidnapped um, and was facing death by cannibalism, um, it was so that she could commit suicide so that she could die in a way that was considered proper for a Victorian lady. My favorite story about her and her, um, her proper wardrobe choices is there's one time that she fell into a 15 foot deep pit that was lined with poisonous steaks, but because she was wearing such thick skirts, they didn't pierce her skin. So after she was pulled out of this pit, she said, it is at these times you realize the blessing of a good thick skirt. So the way that she was able to fund her travels is by collecting, um, collecting specimens for the British Museum. And these are three previously undiscovered fish that all bear her name. You can see the scientific name down there at the bottom. And she also became a well-known and respected author. She wrote Travels in West Africa in 1897, followed by West African Studies in 1899. And she eventually returned home and became a popular lecturer. She gave talks at the Scottish and Liverpool Geographical Societies, where at first she sat silently on stage while a male member read her papers because a woman was not allowed to speak. Uh, she was eventually allowed to start reading her papers, but when she began, um, that, was the, that was sort of the arrangement that they reached. She unfortunately died pretty young. When she was 38, she contracted typhoid when she was taking her third trip down to Africa. Um, she was volunteering as a nurse for Afrikaans prisoners of war. And once she found out that she was sick and that she wasn't gonna recover, she sent everyone away because she quote, wanted to die alone like an animal so that no one could see her weakness. Um, the Mary Kingsley Society was founded in her honor and it was later renamed the Royal African Society. And this is an organization that still operates today. 
This is Ada Blackjack, and she's an Inupiaq woman who was born near the gold rush town of Nome, Alaska. And in spite of the fact that she was ethnically Inupiaq, she wasn't brought up in traditional ways. So she was actually raised by missionaries and was taught enough English to be able to read the Bible. When she was 16, she married a local dog musher named Jack Blackjack, and the two of them had three children, but two of them died pretty young. And this is her with her remaining son, Bennett. Um, unfortunately, Bennett had a lot of health issues and was always a sickly child. And at one point, Jack abandoned Ada and um, she was forced to walk 40 miles in the snow back to the nearest town. Um, and because Bennett was only three at the time, she had to pick him up and carry him through the snow when he was too tired to walk. So because of his health problems, Ada, even though it killed her to have to do this, she put him into an orphanage so that he could get the medical care that he needed. And she swore that she was going to find a way to make enough money to be able to get him back out. And the way in which she was able to do that came along in 1921, when she heard of an expedition organized by a charismatic Arctic explorer called Wilhelm Stephenson. And you can see in this picture, Ada's in the center and she's surrounded by four young men. And if you look on the far right hand side, there's a little cat perched on um, that man's knee and that, that's Vic and Vic will pop back up again later. So basically Stephenson had organized this completely ill-conceived negligent mission to seize Wrangell Island, which is this speck of gravel north of Siberia. And he um, had no intention of going on this expedition himself. So he sent four relatively inexperienced young men. And even though they were going for a year, he told them to only bring six months of supplies because he said the friendly Arctic would provide everything that they needed. And so Ada was employed to sew the winter survival gear that they would need out on Wrangell Island. Initially, their expedition was going pretty well. This is a picture of their camp. Um, it's a little pixelated, but you can see that's Ada standing in front of one of the tents. Um, but unbeknownst to them, when Stephenson sent them in, he hadn't actually raised the money to send the rescue ship that would pick them up a year later. And the way that things work in these high northern latitudes is there's a really small weather window when the sea isn't frozen solid. And so if the sea ice freezes, you can't get a ship in until the following season after it clears. So um, the team began to realize that no one was coming for them and they were facing basically another year before there would be any help. Um, this is a picture of Vic in camp. So things were getting pretty dire. They were running out of food and one of the men was suffering from what was undiagnosed scurvy. And the decision was made that three of the men would go overland and try and walk to Siberia to get help. And Ada was left behind with Lorne Knight, a man who was sick. And um, it was her job to care for him. So this is basically the point when Ada becomes a complete badass. And this is her removing blubber from a seal skin. So she taught herself how to shoot and she built a platform above their camp out of driftwood so that she'd be able to see polar bears coming on the horizon. She also made a boat after theirs was destroyed in the storm. She learned how to set trap lines. And my favorite um, record of what she did is because the men had, you know, kind of brought along scientific equipment while they were there. There was a camera and so she actually toyed around with taking selfies. And one of the men had brought a typewriter. And so every time before Ada would go out to hunt or check her trap lines, she would dutifully try and write the date and where she was going just so that if she died, there would at least be a record of what had happened. Um, unfortunately, Lorne Knight, the man with scurvy, he treated Ada terribly. He was really angry about his circumstances and his helplessness, and um, he really took it out on her. So unfortunately, he passed away, and this is a picture of Ada at his eventual grave, and this is a quote from her journal about that period of taking care of him. He never stop and think how much it's hard for women to take four man's place, to woodwork and to hunt for something to eat for him and to do waiting to his bed and take the shit out for him. So eventually um, a rescue ship was able to arrive and Ada at that point had been alone for three months and walked down to the shore to meet them. And this is a picture of Ada with Vic on the, um, the deck of the Donaldson, the ship that went to retrieve them. And so just to recap, we had four men 
and one woman and one female cat go into the wilderness and all of the men died. The one who tried, to, the ones to walk to Siberia, they disappeared and were never seen again. Um, and Ada and Vic survived. And the crew of the Donaldson noted, quote, Blackjack mastered her environment so far that it seems likely she could have lived there for another year. Sadly, the story takes another um, tragic turn because even though Ada survived and was rescued, in the aftermath, once word got out to the outside world, um, a smear campaign began against her. And a lot of the people involved in the expedition became really rich off the story and Ada saw very little of that money. She was never paid the full amount that she was owed. And basically she was criticized for it being her fault that Lorne Knight had died. Um, and she was really a recluse who didn't like to be in the spotlight and um, did not do well with this unwanted attention. The only ray of light in the story is that the money she was paid was enough to get Bennett back out of the orphanage, so she was able to take him back home, but he never fully recovered and died pretty early at the age of 58. She did remarry um, and had a second son eventually, and she did start talking to the press, trying to clear her name later in life. Uh, this is her with Bennett as she started talking to the press to, to sort of explain her side of the story. But Ada eventually died in 1983 in a nursing home in Palmer, Alaska, and very few people knew about her story, and she was buried at Bennett's side. Her remaining son, Billy, really campaigned with the, um, the state of Alaska to get recognition for her story. So her gravesite does have a marker talking about her as, a, as basically the female Robinson Crusoe. That's what she's known as. This is Fanny Quigley. And um, quick aside, the way that I found out about her story is probably my favorite way. I've, I've stumbled across one of these women. And I was on a a solo 600 mile bike ride in Alaska and in Denali National Park there's one winding gravel road that just dead ends at um, about 90 miles and at the end of this road there was a tiny little cabin with an informational placard and that was Fanny's um, cabin so I, I found out about her by biking past her cabin and, and then became really fascinated to learn more. So stories of the Alaska gold rush are pretty much entirely populated by men, but amongst all the men, there is one five foot tall, 100 pound frontiers woman who did everything that the men did, only better. She wore men's clothes, drank heavily, swore loudly and shot bears. But unlike the men, she was using the bear lard to make the crusts of her legendarily flaky rhubarb pies. And this is Fanny with rhubarb from her garden. She was born in Wahoo, Nebraska into a community of Czech speaking immigrants. And at the age of 16, she headed out west following the expansion of the railroad. And that is where she started working as a cook. And that's also where she really perfected her English, which is perhaps why uh, she had a very renowned vocabulary um, described by one person as figurative language that was fairly Shakespearean in its rugged raciness. So she swore like a sailor. And she eventually, after she got to the West Coast, followed the gold rush up north, initially landing in Canada. And once she got there, she earned the nickname Fanny the Hike. And the way that that happened is during the gold rush, there were stampedes. So there would be um, rumors of gold and all of these men would race to get there first so that they could stake out claims. And Fanny was banking on the fact that they would go in ill-prepared and um, so what she would do is she would take her sheet metal Yukon stove and she would hike dozens, sometimes even hundreds of miles out to these mining stampedes. And she would pitch a tent and put up a sign that said meals for sale. And then she would sell food to these ill-prepared miners. And that's how she became known as Fanny the Hike. In the year 1900, she opened a roadhouse with her first husband. This is a picture of her in front of that roadhouse. And the two of them were both very well-known drinkers. So the relationship was punctuated by screaming matches and broken furniture and mutual black eyes. But in 1903, she decided that she'd had enough. And so she walked out of both her front door and her marriage and she kept walking. So this is a map of Fanny's 800 mile walk. Um, you can see um, starting in Dawson, crossing over into Alaska, and basically following the course of the Yukon River. Um, 
And just to give some context for people who haven't spent time in Alaska, this is how big Alaska is when compared to the lower 48. So she essentially walked across the entire Midwest. <laughs> She eventually wound up in Kantishna following rumors of gold, and this was an area deep in what would eventually become Denali National Park. So at this point, there was no road system and everything had to be brought in over multiple mountain passes by dog sled. And this is where she met her husband, long-legged Joe Quigley. You can obviously see which one he is and why he has that nickname. And the two of them lived together for over a decade before they were married, but everybody just called them man and wife because there was so much social stigma around unmarried cohabitation. So Fanny's dreams of striking it rich off gold never quite panned out, but while she was living in Kantishna, she honed the skills that would eventually cement her reputation as an unparalleled backcountry cook. This is a picture of Fanny hunting. Um, I think most people see this picture and assume that Fanny is in the middle, but that is actually her on the far left. So she, um, she pretty much just wore man's clo men's clothes. Um, she learned how to hunt bear, moose, and caribou. And she also learned how to set trap lines where she was mostly taking pelts of lynx, wolverine, and fox. The other thing that she did is she built raised beds above the permafrost so that she could garden in the frozen ground. And she planted beds of grass so that when dog sled teams would come through, she'd be able to, to give them a, a soft place to rest. She also perfected a quite nice potato beer recipe and she would use the temperature deferentials in Joe's mines as her perfectly calibrated refrigeration system. My favorite story about her is one time she was out hunting and she spotted a moose and she was pretty far away from her cabin. So she knew that if she shot it and left it overnight, um, the animals would take it. So what she did is she shot it, cut it open and climbed inside and spent the night um, tucked away in it. The blood froze solid and the next morning she reported, quote, had a heck of a time chipping my way out. So the reason that her story made its way to the outside world is because she was on the route for teams that were trying to summit Denali, which at the time was still known as Mount McKinley before Obama returned it to its traditional Athabascan name. And so these mountaineers would come through and they would tell this story about the little witch of Kantishna. And this is a, an excerpt about her from a 1930 article in Outing Magazine. Our hostess was one of the most remarkable women I have ever met. She lived the wildlife as the men did and was as much at home in the open with a rifle as a city woman is on a city avenue. From a physical standpoint, she was a living example of what nature had intended a woman to be. And furthermore, while having the ability to do a man's work, she enjoyed life as a man does. So in spite of the fact that she loved being in Kantishna, uh, she spent the bulk of her time there as literally the only member of her gender and that did start to weigh on her. This is a quote from a letter she wrote to a friend. I went to Fairbanks last fall. That was my first trip to town in seven years. I didn't see women for three years. I tell you, I got lonesome. All told, she spent over 30 years living out in Kantishna. Um, she and Joe divorced in 1937 after Joe fell in love with a nurse that he met while recovering from a mining injury. So Joe and his new wife moved south to Seattle and Fanny remained out in Kantishna. And this is actually a sweet story because the miners in the area banded together to build her a cabin, um, which is the one that, that I found while bike touring. And this is a picture of her on that porch. And if you ever happen to find yourself 90 miles into Denali National Park, um, it's owned by the Park Service and you can visit it and I, I highly recommend doing so. So in 1944, when she was 74 years old, uh, Fanny died alone in her cabin. And it seems that she just built a cooking fire and lay down to rest before starting it and then simply passed away peacefully in her sleep. This is Katie Brumbach, but she's better known as the Great Sandwina or the Lady Hercules. And she was one of at least 14 children born to a pair of Bavarian circus performers. Um, she was born into this trade uh, in that she was born in the back of a circus wagon and she was doing handstands on her father's outstretched palms by the time she was two years old. 
So her father was also a strong man. The circus was a family affair. And one of the early acts that he would do is he would shout out to the crowd that if any man could beat her in a wrestling match, he would win 100 gold marks. And when she was 16 years old, there was a acrobat named Max in the audience. And he thought to himself, well, this could be a really great way to uh, make some easy money and drum up some publicity for my career. So uh, he challenged her and she of course destroyed him. But as he looked up from the ground on which she'd thrown him, he fell in love and the feeling was mutual. So this is Katie with her husband, Max. They got married and stayed married for 52 years. And if you think back on that first image of Katie uh, holding someone above her head, that is her husband, Max. So she introduced him into her act as a, as a prop. This is a, a poster showing some of her acts just to give you a sense of the theatricality of, of what she did. And eventually Katie branched off from the family circus and started um, going solo. And in 1902, she crossed paths with the leading strong man of the day, Eugene Sandow, and this is how she ends up with her name, the great Sandwina. So the two of them decided that they were going to have a public showdown that involved them lifting progressively heavier weights until one of them couldn't anymore. And eventually Katie lifted 300 pounds above her head with one hand, while Eugene Sandow could only lift that weight to his chest. So after she beat him in an act that was kind of equal parts homage and emasculation, she decided that she was going to take his name. So Sandwina is the female derivative of Sandow, and that's when she started performing as the great Sandwina. Um, as her career progressed, she started doing more and more theatrical stunts, and I'm just going to read you a, a magazine quote about some of her acts. Balancing on her chest of a revolving merry-go-round with half a dozen adults, throwing from her body half a ton of stone, which had been placed on it with great difficulty by eight men. Well, she concludes the turn by serving as the foundation of a bridge over which pass in double file, a number of people followed by a full grown cart horse. So that is what you're seeing in this picture. Sadly, I couldn't find a photograph of the cart horse going over. Uh, she was really interesting in that she embraced both her strength and her femininity, and the press always wrote about her in these kind of dual terms of being um, still beautiful and feminine and, and perfectly proportioned. And she also bucked trends by really talking about how she saw no contradiction between uh, being strong and being a woman, and she loved beautiful costumes and didn't shy away from from still seeing herself as very feminine. She also defied gender conventions by speaking candidly about her sexual appetites, uh, which is very risque for this time. And this is from an interview in a German newspaper. A very discreet question, my dear madame, are you married? No, I'm still single, but nobody dares to end the situation. Are you interested in men anyway? What shall I say? Men are like air to me. You can't live without them. Every now and then I breathe good fresh air, you know? So for the time, this is, uh, this is very outspoken. And uh, this picture I think really epitomizes the way in which she was really still shown as, a, as an object of uh, sexual desire. She eventually became a mother and of course performed up until the night before her first son was born, at which point she just uh, introduced her son into her act, you know, tossing him around, uh, using him as a weight. And uh, once her second son was born, he also joined the, the family circus. She was a very outspoken proponent of the women's right to vote. And in 1912, she became the vice president of the 800 member suffragette ladies of Barnum and Bailey Circus. And that gave rise to what I think is maybe my favorite newspaper headline ever written. Happy family ruled by giantess makes anti-suffragists tremble. She stayed in the circus until she was almost 60 years old. And when she retired, uh, this was also a family affair. She and Max opened a cafe in Ridgewood, New York, where her husband cooked and her son bartended, which left her free to be the amiable host. And she would actually perform in the cafe. So this is a picture of her two sons, one of whom was a heavyweight boxer 
hammering on her chest with sledgehammers while she holds a bed of nails. So this is a, the dining entertainment you could see if you went to their cafe. And this next image is my favorite picture in this whole talk. This is the great Sandwina and her husband, Max, still performing at their cafe. And there's just so much clear love between them. Uh, she sadly met her match in a fight against cancer and died in 1952 at the age of 67. This is Bessie Coleman and she is a Texas aviatrix and she's the first woman of both African American and Native American descent to hold a pilot's license. She grew up in Texas working in cotton fields and she was somewhat educated but her school basically would shut down at cotton harvest time, but her mother was really um, determined that Bessie get an education. And so she was able to get her books from a passing library wagon, which is how she was able to really gain a sense of, of the broader world. And she worked as a manicurist, but she always said that she wanted to find a way to prove what her race was capable of. And the way that she found to do this actually came through her brother who had been in the military. And when he had been stationed in Europe, he'd seen female pilots. So she decided that she wanted to become a pilot. And her brother said to her, you N-word women ain't never going to fly, not like those women I saw in France. So Bessie decided to go to France. She found a newspaper that would sponsor getting her over there. And she enrolled in one of the prestigious aeronautic institutes um, over in that area. And she wrote about walking nine miles to the airstrip each day. And during the six months that she was a student there, she was the only woman. When she returned to the US, she decided that she wanted to become a stunt pilot to raise money to open a African-American flying school. And she is the first public flight of a black woman. And depending on which newspapers you want to look at, the crowd that watched her first flight was somewhere between one and 3000 people strong. She was mostly ignored by white newspapers, um, but did get more coverage in the black press. But there wasn't necessarily full support for what she was doing um, because a lot of people saw her as stepping away from more traditional roles. And this headline that I'm gonna read you wasn't about her, but it was from one of the black papers at the time. It said, colored women venturing too far from children, kitchen, clothes, and church. So she did get some pushback for what she was doing. And I think it's really important again to just talk about the broader context of US history and where race relations were during this time that she was flying. And there's one anecdote that she talks about where as she was flying, she was able to see from her plane that just a few miles away, there was a KKK rally happening with over 2000 people. So she was really putting herself out there in an era that was absolutely not safe for a black woman to really be doing anything, let alone flying so publicly. She was a very, very smart marketer and she understood that if she was going to raise the money that she needed to start her flying school, she was gonna need publicity in any way that she could get it. And one of the ways in which it seemed like this might happen is at one point a film studio was interested in making a movie about her life. And so she went to New York to do this and only then was she given the script where she saw that it was set for her to open wearing tattered rags and walking with a cane and a limp and basically just fulfilling a lot of racist black stereotypes. And so she told the producers, no Uncle Tom stuff for me. And she walked off the set and never came back. This is her with one of, the, one of her planes and she was flying during an era where plane crashes were extremely common. They were not mechanically reliable and she had a number of crashes. And this is a quote from an interview that she gave from the hospital after one of those crashes. Tell them all that as soon as I can walk, I'm going to fly. My faith in aviation and the useful of it will serve in fulfilling the destiny of my people isn't shaken at all. Sadly, in 1926, when she was only 34 years old, she had a crash that proved fatal. She had been scouting um, to do a parachute jump the following day, and so she wasn't clipped in. And it turns out that a mechanic who had worked on her plane had left a wrench loose in the engine compartment, and it shook free and jammed the controls, and the plane turned upside down, and she fell to the ground. 
um, thousands of feet and was killed immediately on impact. And really morbidly, um, because she was starting to be somewhat high profile, there were immediately souvenir hunters sorting through the wreckage of her plane, trying to keep mementos of it. She did receive wide recognition in death and over 5,000 people showed up to her funeral, even though only 2,000 could fit into the church. So her body was actually taken to a couple of different places to be able to accommodate all the people who wanted to honor her memory. And there are some other things that, um, that are ongoing that people have done to honor her. In 1977, a black women student pilot organization formed the Bessie Coleman Aviation Club. And there's also an annual flyover of her grave. And this is a stamp from Black History Month in 1992 um, commemorating her. And I just wanna read a quote from her to kind of end her story. Cause I think it just sums up how she felt. She said, the air is the only place free from prejudice. This is Hella Espy and her daughter Clara, and the two of them are Washingtonians. They were from Spokane, and they were Norwegian immigrants. And Helga and her husband Oli settled in Spokane, and she had her first child at the age of 16. By the time she was 35, she had given birth to 10 children. Two of them died young in childbirth. So they were farmers and things, they were, they were doing fairly well for themselves, but then Oli got injured and couldn't work and suddenly they weren't able to pay the mortgage on their farm. So at this point, Helga heard of an anonymous wager where someone was offering $10,000 if a woman could walk across the country in less than seven months. And she and her daughter decided that this was gonna be the best way for them to make the money to save their farm. So this is a picture of the route that they took and because there wasn't an established road system across the US at this point, um, people who were doing intercontinental travel, they usually would follow the railroads. And so that is what dictated the route that they followed. Um, they set off with a red pepper pistol and a curling iron, but unfortunately for them, when they left in 1896, it was during one of the worst uh, winters in recent memory, and it rained for 10 days straight once they set out. They eventually got to a Scandinavian town and they were really excited about the prospect of a hot meal and a warm room, but um, sadly, the occupants of the Scandinavian town felt that they were not good women. And in particular, they felt that Helga had abandoned her role as a mother. And so the whole town shunned them. And even though they had money, they wouldn't let them buy any provisions or have a place to sleep. And so they ended up um, shivering alone in the train depot for the night. It's hard to overstate what they were contending with just in terms of weather and terrain on this trip. Um, they talk about having to post hole through snow, cross mountain passes and ford rivers in flood. And they also talk nonchalantly about mountain lions. This is um, them talking about how they dealt with mountain lions. Being acquainted with the animal's traits, we knew they never attacked from behind and never accept by running and springing upon a victim. We kept up a steady pace and kept the animal about 10 feet behind us. So that, that is their nonchalant way of just dealing with being stalked by a mountain lion. And they talk about making sure to have a fire at night to keep them away. Um, another thing that they had to contend with, because again, they were following the railroads, is the railroad ties would get really hot in the sun. And so all the snakes would wanna come sun themselves on them. And they described the landscape as being so thick with rattlesnakes as to make it almost impossible to get along. They also had to deal with men harassing them. And this is an illustration from a newspaper article after a man had followed them for multiple days and Helga was uh, forced to eventually shoot him to get him to leave her alone. And she was happy to report that she was not arrested. It was proclaimed self-defense. Sadly, this is another story that ends with a woman not receiving what she was due. So the two of them did successfully complete this walk across the country, but the uh, wealthy benefactor never emerged. And it seems likely that it was all, uh, it was never expected to be done. It was a publicity stunt. And so the two of them ended up stranded in New York with no way to even get home. 
they took jobs working in factories and they wrote to everyone they possibly could trying to find a sponsor just so that they could go back to their family. Um, eventually they were able to find someone who gave them the money for train tickets back, but tragically two of Helga's children had died of illness while she was gone. And so the family really saw her as a disgrace and a failure who had abandoned her duties and they never really forgave her for going on this trip. Um, the way that they expressed this displeasure is they actually burned all of her journals and notes. Um, both Helga and Clara had kept very detailed notes so that they could eventually write a book about this trip, but the family destroyed them. And the only reason that her story ended up still known is because one descendant felt that it wasn't right to destroy this full record. And so they saved the press clippings and that's how their story was able to be reconstructed. It's just by following the newspaper coverage that they were receiving as they crossed the US. Um, another really interesting sort of serendipitous thing that happened with them is there is a, a really good book written about Helga uh, called Bold Spirit. And the way that that came about is an English teacher assigned a family history essay to her class. And one of the students wrote about his ancestors forgotten walk across Victorian America. And this teacher became so interested that she started researching it and actually wrote this book. So today, thankfully, um, there are a couple of books and her story is known, but it's really only because that one family member saved that book of press clippings. Otherwise this story would have been lost forever. The last one I'm gonna talk about is Fanny Bullock Workman and she could be in this talk as any number of things, a cyclist, a mountaineer, a geographer, cartographer, lecturer, author, you name it, she was a polymath. She was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1859 and was born into a pretty high class household, um, but she really chafed against the social expectations of a proper Brit British woman. And she spent her younger years writing a thinly veiled fiction in which uh, dashing adventurers would save wealthy heiresses and take them to more exciting lives. That kind of happened for her when she ended up marrying William Hunter Workman, who was a doctor 10 years her senior. And what he did that really changed her life was he introduced her to mountain climbing. And they were living in New England at the time. And this was actually an area that had surprisingly progressive um, outdoor politics. So she actually learned to climb in co-ed groups. And what this did for her is it made her decide that she was always going to pair her love of the outdoors with her sense of gender activism. What, what they're mostly known for uh, are a series of very long bike trips. So this is a picture of Fanny on her bike. And the two of them had two children and they would leave them in the care of nursemaids when they jaunted off on international trips. And the first trip they took was through Italy, France and Switzerland, which I believe is about 400 miles. But right around that time, their only son died of illness. And that was the point at which Fanny really doubled down on an identity outside of motherhood. And that's when the two of them started doing much more ambitious, longer travels, including this one, Sketches a Wheel in Modern Iberia, which was about a 3,000 mile ride across Spain. And this is just one of eight books that the couple would eventually go on to co-author. And you can see here um, that she always made sure to list her accomplishments as well as her husband's. So this was their biggest trip, which took them two years through town and jungle, 14,000 miles a wheel among the temples and people of the Indian plain. And I'll just show you a couple of pictures from this trip. This is them crossing a river in a dugout canoe. This is Fanny in front of the temple. And this is kind of a, a typical image of what their camp setup would be. So she did insist on biking in, uh, in full skirts, even though at this point women were starting, were starting to wear bloomers, um, but she was not somebody who bought into that idea. She was kind of traditional in that way. So the trip on bikes ended at the base of the Himalayas, and that is when they swapped out wheels for ropes. And Fanny set off into the mountains where she would set a series of women's altitude records that wouldn't be broken for over 20 years. And this is a picture of what their climbing garb looked like. 
This is a picture of one of their typical camp setups while mountaineering. And it should be noted that uh, when I say that Fanny doubled down on an identity outside of motherhood, she actually missed their only daughter's wedding because she was out exploring the Karakoram Glacier. This is far and away the most famous picture of Fanny and it was taken in 1912. She was a strong proponent of women's suffrage and this is her standing at 21,000 feet of elevation on the Siachen Glacier, holding a newspaper that says votes for women as the headline. She died in France in 1925, but she left behind large endowments at four colleges in New England. And so to this day, there are women's fellowships available in her name. So this concludes the part of this talk where I tell you the stories of adventurous women in history. And there are so, so, so many more. So this is just, this is the tip of an endless iceberg. I'm, I'm happy to report. And I wish I had time to, to talk more about them. But one of the things I love about being part of the Speakers Bureau is these talks are about how we connect these topics of inquiry with how we actually live now. And so I want to shift to asking a broader question of why do the stories of these women matter now? And to answer this, I want to explain what led me to this topic of strong, curious women. Almost a decade ago, I was supposed to be getting married and uh, I set off on a solo bike ride from Southern California to Maine with the idea that I would just get my pesky restlessness out of my system and uh, come back ready to accept that I'd had some good adventures that were now behind me and uh, be ready to face my future as someone's wife. Um, that, not surprisingly, is not what happened. And I did indeed find a life partner just in the form of my bicycle. And I ended up calling off an engagement while illegally camped in a cow pasture in West Texas and have really never stopped biking. So once I found some geographic distance from a man who loved me as something he possessed and who told me how much freedom I was allowed to want, I found myself again. I found my way out of a controlling, emotionally abusive relationship by means of a 5,000 mile bike ride. But during my four months on the road, I heard the same thing every day. A woman can't travel alone. And at the outset, when I heard this, I, I, was, pretty, I was pretty shy in responding to it. Um, would say something like, um, I do believe you might perhaps be slightly mistaken there. But after about 130 back-to-back -back iterations, coupled with men telling me on a daily basis that I was crazy, stupid, naive, and incapable of doing what I was actively in the process of doing, I got a little bit feistier about it. Sweetheart, you have no idea just how deeply wrong you are. So I had a lot of time to think about how women become trapped. And in my own case, I felt both confused and ashamed that I'd lost myself within a toxic relationship. I came to understand that we can only pursue those horizons that we can envision. And I hadn't encountered a narrative that showed me I had a choice. I hadn't heard a story that told me I was allowed to yearn for something more than what my society had modeled for me. I became owned because I didn't have the counter examples I so desperately needed. And on my own, I wasn't strong enough to fight the gener generational echoes of a system that told me I was not permitted to belong to myself. So I started researching this topic because I wanted the strength of 150 years of backup. And these women are remarkable because they created options that didn't exist. Given the times that they were operating in, they had no models, no communities, no support networks. By today's standards, they wrestled their independence out of thin air. So I wanna go back to this idea of a communications technology timeline, because right now we're living in another moment of technological reinvention. If we did back in time, the internet really only happened in 1990 and AOL only happened in 1993. Um, if anyone remembers AIM, Instant Messenger, uh, the first message ever sent there was from a man to his wife saying, don't be scared, it is me. Facebook came along in 2004 and the iPhone was only invented in 2007. So I wanna take a moment to just think on the fact that 
we're less than 15 years into this experiment of smartphones and look at how much it's changed everything about how we move through the world and connect with others. Now we're living in a moment where there are hundreds, if not thousands of platforms that exist solely to help us share and broadcast stories about our lives. In the early 1900s, the way these women chose to live mattered deeply, but the available means of communication were such that the impacts of their life stories were limited. They end up standing as exemplary scattered stars who are lost against the night sky of history. But their stories and the records of those stories still exist and we can dig up these narratives and rebroadcast them through today's platforms. It's certainly an interesting moment to be a woman in America and the feelings of helplessness, frustration, exhaustion and rage are palpable and real. But I wanna take a moment to shift gears a little bit because I think if we're talking about women's rights, particularly the Me Too movement, um, we really need to talk about the idea of intersectionality and especially given the uprisings in response to George Floyd's death and the fact that America is in a moment of racial reckoning, I would be remiss if I didn't touch upon that right now as part of this talk. So while talking about women's rights is important, right now, that's not the focus. And I especially wanna talk about the fact that with intersectionality and this idea that gender, class and race um, can't really be separated. That's an idea that came from Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a black legal scholar, and she coined that in an essay. Um, when we talk about the Me Too movement, that is something that was founded by Tarana Burke, another black female activist. And I just think it's important that we acknowledge where these terms that we talk about in terms of feminism are coming from. And things like the hashtag say her name and identity politics, these are all coming from black women. And feminism, particularly white feminism, has a very poor track record of throwing women of color under the bus when it comes to really addressing the fact that we need to be a champion racial equity um, while we're talking about gender rights. So I just wanna read a quote from Toni Morrison on this note. Your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. So particularly given that uh, I'm giving this talk right now during Black History Month, I just wanna acknowledge how much of our contemporary understanding of feminism comes from women of color. But I believe that right now, we're also living in an era that gives us a new sense of hope for change. Our modern capacities for mass communication are allowing us to shift the conversation from the individual and to the systemic. We're finding new ways to talk about the realities of gender inequity. And it's a process that we will continue to falter in as we learn how to give form to the new kinds of stories we need. The lives of these seven women are an integral part of what has already been a very long fight. And if we share these stories through the methods that we have available today, what we're able to see is that these women were never aberrations. They were instead redefinitions. They were paving the way for the people who followed them to demand more freedom. They're not scattered stars. They're in fact, part of a large and ongoing constellation. The strongest critique of a system lies in demonstrating the viability of living outside of it. Women need role models who can demonstrate that they are entitled to desire freedom on their own terms. But this message can only change horizons if it is received. And so the physical heft of these women's lives matters deeply. In a very real way, these women set me free. They gave me permission to define freedom for myself and spreading their stories is something I see as both a joy and an obligation. So I'd like to end with a passage from Fanny Bullock Workman's book, Two Summers in the Ice Wilds of the Eastern Karakoram. The object of placing my full name in connection with the Siachen Glacier Expedition is not because I wish in any way to thrust myself forward, but solely that in the accomplishments of women now and in the future, it should be known to them and stated in print that a woman was the initiator and special leader of this expedition. When later, woman occupies her acknowledged position as an individual worker in all fields, 
as well as those of exploration, no such emphasis of her work will be needed. But that day has not fully arrived. And at present, it behooves women, for the benefit of their sex, to put what they do at least on record. The lives of these seven women fought for gender equity during the eras in which they lived, and the stories of those lives continue their fight now. Thank you for letting me share their stories.